pleasure for me to introduce Peter Metzner. Peter Metzner is a PCC and BCC coach with really an amazing, amazing experience as international coach over various sectors, the whole hatch, I think, the, the, his bio. He's also a teacher at some universities. Um, but what, what touched me most is that during the first conversations I had with him, is a very, very human approach to teamwork. He talked about the gigantic impact that bosses have on teams. He talked about the gigantic impact that bosses have on collaboration. He also talked about personality typing and about conflicts. Coming to the conclusion that you may have competencies as much as you want, you may have talents as much as you want, you may have a strategy. If for some reason there is a conflict between you and your boss, you may forget it. And his title chosen, I liked it very much, is Taming for the Angry Executive. I like that title very much, and it is now with a lot of pleasure that I give the floor to Peter. Great. Thank you, Carl, and, uh, and Elizabeth for setting this up. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and wish everybody a Happy New Year uh, to start. And I'd like to share how I got involved with um, working with, let's say, the Angry Executives. And, uh, uh, I guess midway in my coach career, after about five or six years of coaching, I uh, was a member of going to a meeting, it was a luncheon and, for coaches, and everybody introduced themselves and, and uh, talked about all the wonderful things they were doing, and unfortunately within an hour the time was marching on, and um, I was probably number 18 or 19 on the list, so I just stood up to introduce myself and I said, my name is Peter Metzner and I work with Angry Executives, and I sat down. And it got a good laugh, and all of a sudden, um, my niche was born, and I started getting referrals for angry executives. And I didn't realize at that time just how many that there were. So across the um, years, I guess this is now seven years later or eight years later, um, I've been working with a lot of angry executives. And um, one of the things that is very rewarding for me is that uh, along the way, I've helped quite a number of people not only keep their jobs, uh, but also turn things around. Another thing that's noteworthy is that um, in all the years of coaching, I've never met one that intentionally tried to shut people down or make their life difficult. I know there are folks out there uh, that might be beyond the realm of coaching, but what I did find is that everybody that I worked with was coming from integrity, right intention, and really wanting to do the right thing. And so for that, I realized that when I help, could help a person be more aware more mindful and responsible for how they impact people. It not only affected them, um, but it also profoundly affected their teams as well as their home life too. So what I'd like to do is uh, in a, just a little bit share some of the slides I put together. Um, I want to share one more story about how this is also um, personally and emotionally, I guess, very um, important for me. Um, when I was in the uh, working world, before I got into coaching, I was a sales trainer and um, had worked in uh, medical sales and uh, had a boss that was, um, you would, I guess, look at the ideal profile of the angry executive. And he, technologically, he was very adept. He knew his business. He worked very hard. And uh, he had an amazing industry contact. But unfortunately, um, his style was so direct or too direct or even angry, um, I found myself shutting down. And then, to me, in spite of my boss. I felt like I was doing pretty good work, but that's really where um, this started coming from, my direct experiences of what it's like to work for an angry executive. So when I work with clients emotionally, I know exactly the impact that they're having, and it just gives me that extra um, insight, motivation, if you might, on how to help that person be more aware and also get to the results that they want. And I do believe everybody that I have worked with, especially um, the higher up they go, they really do want to be successful and be great leaders. So what I'd like to do is just share a few slides. And then, Carl, is if you um, see um, themes or questions coming up or, or want to stop me, um, please do any time if there's something of interest that we might want to talk a little bit further. I will, Peter. OK, super. So let me see if I can advance the slide. And it was working uh, before. Let's see if it'll if it'll work. Yes, here we go. 
Yep. And it could be my computer. So um, the, pro the first proverb um, that I have, a Chinese proverb, if you're patient in a moment of anger, you'll escape 100 days of sorrow. Well, I think that's very true. And having uh, two teenage daughters, I think that I could amend that, say, if you're a parent and are patient in a moment of anger, you'll escape 1,000 days of sorrow. Um, I like to tell my clients, you know, if you're patient in a moment of anger, you'll escape 10 hours of coaching. <laughs> uh, and so um, even though um, uh, I do believe coaching is very uh, forward-moving, proactive, and is actually a benefit, um, I find that's an icebreaker. Um, but I do find that many of the people who are coming to me, um, they're actually referred. In my experience with these, um, I don't like the word so much bad bosses, but that is a title of one, an article in Inc. Magazine. That's why I included it. Um, for me, what I found is that very, very, very rarely will a person who is considered unaware or angry or too driven, uh, it's very rare that they'll actually look for coaching. Uh, but they will be referred, and so that most of the people who come to me are referred either by their boss or by um, an organization that I'm affiliated with that, that actually works with a number of companies. So here's the, um, the business model for the cost of bad boss, bosses. Um, the Gallup organization, um, years ago they did a survey of over a million people, and what they found is that 80%, four out of five, um, cited the number one reason people left their companies or organizations was their boss. So they, what they said is, I didn't leave my company, I left my boss. And so whenever there is turnover, it's more than likely a manager management issue or a supervisor issue. Um, the Gallup organization also found that the most important factor in employee success is the relationship with their direct supervisor. So some of the costs then, when you have a unaware, angry, or let's say bad boss, uh, it does affect the teams profoundly and that there is enough research to show that work groups on average are 50% less productive, um, they're less profitable by 44%, and Inc. Magazine even found in uh, one of their surveys that bad bosses cost the economy for over $360 billion a year. Uh, I told that to someone else the other day and they, and, uh, they thought, well, that must be an underestimate. <laughs> uh, she had a, a, a bad boss, or numerous bad bosses herself. So there's the, um, the need for it. And uh, if you're looking at the return on investment, I think that uh, when I can help a boss not only turn things around instead of driving people away, but engage them, um, it's a, a small fraction. Um, the cost of coaching is but a small, small fraction of the benefit of what happens when you're able to not only retain valued employees and keep them, but actually have them uh, performing at a higher level. So the return on investment is huge. So uh, again, the Gallup organization, and there are studies across the world, and the general consensus is, is that 75%, 70 to 75% of workers report that their bosses are the most stressful part of their jobs. <laughs> and uh, I laugh, but it's, it's, um, it's very interesting, I think very true. Um, I, Pick this slide. Um, I use um, Patrick Lencioni's uh, this pyramid um, to highlight the impact of, a, of unaware leadership or management on a team. And when there is a manager, the higher up they go, I do believe that the um, more unaware they are or the things that they still have to work on are magnified by the amount of people that they supervise. And if a boss is driven by anger, and I'd like to say uh, that anger often is a cover up for fear or hurt or pain or sense of not being in control or in charge. And when a person is driven by negative emotions like fear or anger, um, it does tend to uh, impede trust. Um, people often become afraid of these bosses and uh, some of the stories that they say, well, I'm not going to get feedback, I want to keep my job. And so they fear conflict and then what happens, it does affect commitment. And I think we've all heard about the silos is that uh, when there are silos, it's often a result of the lack of trust, the fear of conflict, or fear of being punished. And the bottom line is it, it affects results. And so many executives will say, I want results, but there's a process to help. I think that's very necessary to get to the results, and that's building a team where there's trust, the ability to give and receive feedback, and also have agreed behaviors and a real emotional commitment to the mission of the company. And these are things that can be done in coaching, certainly. So what I'd like to do is just share um, how 
emotions do affect one another profoundly. I think it was Emerson that said that 90 percent, uh, well, what he said is this, is that what you are speaks so loudly I can't even hear what you're saying. And I think research shows um, from a psychological standpoint that about 90 percent of our messages or our communication is nonverbal. So we can say the right thing, but if we are angry, stressed, or anxious, or uh, have something on our mind, it does affect people profoundly. So that we are picking up from um, each other, our, eye, um, our facial expressions, eye contact, or lack of it, body language. And so um, I like to say from this slide, resonance is contagious, and so is dissonance. And what I'd like to do is just share a couple of slides of how that impacts the brain. And let me uh, get to this. So, for instance, when we are stressed or angry, um, this came from um, Richard Boyatzis, um, who did speak at the 2014 conference in Cleveland. Um, and some of the things that really resonated with me um, is that when we are angry or stressed, uh, our brain doesn't work that well. And one of the things that happens when you have a leader or a manager, let's say if he's banging his fist on the table and saying, this has to be done by Friday, or, or what's wrong with this? Why aren't we getting these results? Well, what his research has shown is that when somebody is angry um, and there's a climate of fear, results are less likely to happen. And uh, he even said that um, when a manager or a supervisor is angry, it can actually lower the IQ of their staff. <laughs> yeah, uh, not only um, that, but it does activate this, their fight or flight syndrome or system, which um, is the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. So for instance, if we're running away from a tiger, that's the um, fight or the flight, and that's our sympathetic nervous system being activated. And on this slide, it just goes to show what happens biochemically. Um, our stress hormones are activated. Um, you have cortisol, um, as well as some of the others, um, neuroephrine and adrenaline is another way to look at it. Um, and so what happens, our blood pressure increases. Uh, we're, instead of a tiger, um, the boss, our body is now looking at the boss as a tiger. Blood pressure increases. Uh, we get superhuman strength in our arms and legs. And non-essential functions in our brain start to shut down. And so, uh, for instance, um, if we're running from a tiger, um, this is no time to look at what a nice sunny day it is today or to think about um, what we want to have for dinner. Um, so non-essential functions shut down, uh, digestion, wound healing, as well as higher level thinking. So when we have a boss who is typically an angry executive, uh, we start to shut down. And um, because our sympathetic nervous system is activated, um, we start to, um, if it's chronic especially, uh, it affects our immune system, our health, uh, our ability to learn, our ability to be creative, and to actually cope very well. And then what happens with long-term stress, um, and this comes from Robert Sapolsky, who's a leading authority on stress, uh, what he found is that if we are in a state of chronic stress, uh, it can actually kill the nucleus of the neuron. And uh, there are a number of doctors who are now seeing the smoking gun to early onset of dementia um, is related to stress. Long-term chronic stress can actually kill the nucleus of the neuron. So what does that mean for work? is that if we have a boss that's angry and we're living in a chronic state of fear or anger or uh, not feeling safe, uh, we, feel, we will feel anxious, nervous, depressed. It will affect our immune system. And there are even articles that in the newspaper, I've read in the Raleigh newspaper, there is research that shows um, that the type A driven and angry boss can actually uh, promote heart disease um, with their staff. Um, it's already been well noted uh, there's a Duke psychologist, Redford Williams, who's an experimental psychologist, and uh, he wrote a book, Anger Kills, and what he found, it's a best-selling book, and what he found is that those executives, the type A, hostile, driven, and angry, um, tend to get heart attacks at an earlier age, so that the anger um, and the expression of hostility is intimately linked with coronary heart disease, and what's even more amazing to me is that can actually affect the cardiovascular health of the people around them. So that stress triggers more stress, and it actually impedes results in a very profound way. So when you get to the opposite, and this is why I think for um, coaching, um, as well as our own self-management, if every day we can do something to activate the relaxation response, that uh, was coined uh, by Herbert Benson from Harvard, 
that when we activate the relaxation response, uh, whether we do it from meditation or yoga or gardening or running, listening to music, I think there's thousands of ways to do things that are rejuvenating and relaxing. Uh, when we activate the parasympathetic nervous system, um, this is when wound healing starts taking place and higher level functions of the brain are actually activated. And some of the ways that actually can activate this, and I think the coaching model when we do work with people, you know, uh, just working to wanting to understand, care for another person, um, doing something that contributes to the well-being actually um, activates our sympathetic nervous, our parasympathetic nervous system. And there has been research that shows even uh, with college students, uh, some researchers came in to a classroom and they showed a film of Mother Teresa helping the poor in Calcutta and the students who were watching that film after they um, uh, analyzed her saliva before and after they found that even just watching Mother Teresa perform some of her charitable acts that uh, immune their, the subject's immune system had actually um, been profoundly affected and one of the, one of the antibodies in immunoglobin A was, uh, was actually impacted in a very profound way. Uh, with the exception of those uh, guys sitting in the back of the room who could care less about Mother Teresa, uh, theirs didn't change at all. So what happens when we are um, caring, listening, um, doing something that's helpful, it does affect our biochemistry. It affects the biochemistry of the people that we're working with. And some of the words that actually, I think, um, help activate the parasympathetic nervous system are feeling hopeful, optimistic, being calm, at peace, excited, looking forward to the future, and it can even affect our blood pressure in a very profound way. So really and truly, when we are calm and peaceful, our brain is working better, and we are much better able to problem solve, and those leaders that can understand this, I think it can help them be a whole lot more effective, so that the message is being dominant uh, really is not the most effective leadership competency, but being able to be calm and peaceful and looking at the right, at the for the right opportunities to help people grow and um, develop empathy. These are the things that uh, can engage people and actually lead to much greater results. So there's the biochemistry. Um, what I've included here, um, and this is a tool that I've used. It uh, came from a template many, many years ago from a program I've been in, and I've been modifying it over the years. I've, I've given it to a number of psychologists to look at and tweak. And what I have done with this is to basically share how our thoughts can trigger our emotions, our emotions can trigger behavior, and then our behavior actually has an effect on our leadership. And so um, to kind of encapsulate this in a nutshell, um, the Dalai Lama had um, mentioned, uh, there's a book called The Art of Living, and it was written by a psychiatrist, I forget his name, um, but he'd interviewed the Dalai Lama, and he wanted to see if um, some of his um, philosophy um, and Buddhist teachings um, had merit and could be um, tied to the research model of modern psychology or psychiatry. And one of the um, quotes that came out, like a lightning bolt from that book, um, in one of their conversations was, that most unethical, self-defeating, and hurtful behavior, self-living behavior, comes from negative emotions. And if we don't learn to manage these emotions, they will manage us. And when these emotions drive our behavior, that's when we do things that are actually counterproductive. So this little slide um, I found to be very helpful in having a conversation um, with clients, as, and I use this in training, is to be able to see how a belief, if there's a negative belief, and if we're operating from a negative place, I put critical self here, that a negative belief can trigger negative emotion, and that negative emotion, if we don't learn to be aware of it and manage it, will drive self-defeating behavior, will affect our, our leadership, and thus it, it reinforces, uh, reinforces the belief. And so here are some of the common beliefs that um, I found many of the angry executives um, have that I work with. So if I ask them in an intake, so what's going on here? So what's your current situation? Um, I'll hear stories like, well, I'm the only one that cares, or people are only here for a paycheck, or it's really hard to find motivated workers. And uh, so these are the number of things that they believe, or I only yell at people when they deserve it, or people around me, if I'd be happy if people were confident. 
So they have these beliefs, and these beliefs, if they're negative about their staff, triggers the negative emotions, and then that triggers their angry behavior, their aggressive behavior, let's say, and then it's affecting people negatively. It's putting them into their uh, fight or flight, and, and uh, if the boss is in the fight, staff underneath typically tend to be in the flight, and so then what happens, this becomes a self-reinforcing kind of cycle. And so what I find the aim of coaching and working with these individuals is to, in a very respectful, kind, and uh, um, uh, let's say helpful way, to help them build the self-awareness and get to that place of ownership where they understand how these dynamics are taking place and then help them understand the behaviors that are going to actually help create followership and engagement. So then first comes the awareness, and then if you go to the middle of the screen, um, you'll see the intention and helping them create an intention, and then re reframing their beliefs and helping them recognize that they can choose to adopt different beliefs. Um, I have a magnet on my fridge um, that I often, that says, don't believe everything that you think. <laughs> and so I try to, again, challenge some beliefs and help them understand that if they allow themselves to go into the, um, let's say, the negative or critical aspect of the circle, they will act in a way to make people behave to justify how they think and feel. And so Peter. once they can hopefully Peter. get that awareness and with that intention I, to be Peter, mindful I, to then operate more out of the positive emotions and to help people feel safe. And so when that happens, it can be a very profound and dramatic, um, dramatic experience and what I find just with this one little sheet is that it really does help understand some of these dynamics without pathologizing, without saying that there's anything wrong, but just giving them, um, in a sense, um, an understanding and an awareness of what it takes and how positivity can actually trigger the behaviors that they want a lot more effectively than negativity. So there we so there we are with that. Um, on this, uh, with again with the limited time that we have, what I'd like to do is just share um, the typical personality profile of the angry executive. Um, I find that when I do work with an individual or team, um, I often will bring personality into it. And realizing there are many 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 great personality profiles. There's a disc. I use uh, one called the People Map. There's the MBTI. Um, many of them are four quadrants. I know there's one with colors and one with animals. Um, but I think if you go to the essence of these, even the MBTI, which came from um, Carl Jung's four um, um, archetypal type of energies, I think that one thing that they have in common is if you look at the right, you've got the driver, the bulldozer, results-oriented. Um, that would be the D and DISC or the leader and people map. Um, then you go down clockwise, you have the analytical type of a mind where they're task-oriented, detailed, and thorough. Um, and then on the other part, you have the relationship, kind, helpful, people-oriented. These would be the Fs on the Myers-Briggs, um, or the Ss, let's say, in the DISC. And then you have the um, expressive types. You know, the creative needs independence and autonomy. And what's important with personality is we don't want to ever put anybody in a box, and I think it needs to be looked at very positively. Uh, but if you look at a high-performing team, um, if you look at the driver, you, you need results. Um, you go down to analytical, you need accountability. You need to have good relationships, and you also need to have innovation. And unfortunately, when you have an angry executive, someone that's too driven, too decisive, too decisive or too results-oriented, he may stifle the innovation. Uh, he may shut down people who are relationship-oriented, and those that are task-oriented may find themselves working too, too hard to meet the excessive demands of the angry executive. So where I put the two bullseyes, or the two targets, uh, in my experience, um, and probably since 2001, um, I've probably assessed close to 10,000 people, and that's including groups and teams and, and working with um, various conferences. And what I found is that predominantly, certainly not all the time, but predominantly, most of the people who are coined or come in as the angry executives uh, they would be in a quadrant of being a driver expressive, a bulldozer, and uh, that would be often the ESTJ in the Myers-Briggs, if anyone has been working with that. Uh, their mantra is often, help me be open to other people's ideas, wrong as they may be. <laughs> and then um, you have these quadrants where they're driven, 
And if they're not relationship oriented from their personality um, inadvertently, um, they can shut people down and then wonder why they're shutting down and at the same time be operating uh, from the greatest um, amount of integrity. Whoops. So let me get back to that. Um, I hey, saw hey, a, a button hey, here Peter. and I'm going Peter, to uh, me? the messages that are coming. So um, what I find and part of the process when I do work with um, angry executives or those that are unaware, um, what I like about personality is it does give some insight. Um, it is very positive and when you look at some of the feedback that they've been given or um, some of the behaviors that they've been exhibiting, uh, what I found is that it's often the misuse or overuse of their strengths. And uh, a way to, to frame that is our virtues will become our vice or overused. So as an example, if um, there is an executive that is too driven, he can actually or she can actually activate contempt with their staff. Um, decisiveness is a virtue, but if there's one that's too decisive, he may not listen to other people's ideas or get or really um, be reflective enough and may make decisions that um, could actually be detrimental. So I think the personality, uh, the understanding of personality uh, for me has been a very important uh, component of helping people develop the kind of awareness and self-acceptance and acceptance of others. And if you look at this from, um, let's say, a, a team standpoint, if there is a bulldozer, let's say, or a leader type that is, has the strong skills, and if they do not have the soft skills, then you can see here's where they need to grow as a leader so that they can create the kind of engagement that's necessary for team success. And of course, those soft skills, listening, praising, being open to other people's ideas um, to balance those hard skills. So uh, I find over and over and over again when um, somebody is referred to me that they're going to fall in one of these two quadrants. And sometimes I get accused of um, um, being a company before they talk to me, say, were you listening outside of our door? How do you know this? How do you know these things are happening? And I think after all these um, uh, uh, people I've worked with, um, along with these profiles, you can pretty much um, determine um, some of the things that are actually happening, uh, where they're being perceived as being critical, judgmental, bulldozed, and the resulting um, lack of engagement, passive aggressive behavior, negativity, and turnover tends to be a direct result of, of these behaviors. And unfortunately, human nature is such that we see what's around us, but we have a hard time understanding how we've triggered the very behaviors that we don't see. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, part of the drama, is that I can acutely be aware of other people's flaws, but I can't see my own. And so that's where um, coaching can be very, very helpful to help people become more aware and responsible for their behaviors. Okay, um, I can't can hear you, Harris. Uh, I can hear you now. Okay, great. We've got a few questions that are coming in, and I'm having to jump in because um, we're having a little bit of tech difficulty here. Um, okay. So I'm gonna. So if you don't mind, I'll just uh, relay a few of the questions that have come in. Uh, quite a few. Um, sure. So one. One is coming in from Gay Lynn, and they said, "What if the angry exec is at the top?" Can his or her direct reports refer him or her? An exec above my clients is a classic angry exec and totally unaware and sees himself in the opposite way. Yeah. He brought in the coaches for his people. Much of my coaching focuses on how they can deal with his critical behavior. Right. Yes, that's a great question. And uh, to get to you, and again, what I have found, these individuals are going to be very very reluctant, even resistant to going to coaching. And so for me to work with them, um, there has to be a referral. Now I've worked with some executives who were at the um, C level, uh, but they've had to have somebody refer to them. And if it is a president, it would have to be a board. Um, it might have to be a board member that actually refers them. Um, the difficulty with that is that sometimes these individuals um, are very effective in managing upwards so that the board, unless they're very, very involved, may be unaware of that person's behavior. So there does need to be some leverage to get them to go to coaching. Um, there's a saying, when the pain of not changing becomes greater than the fear of change, change occurs. And when somebody is referred to coaching, sometimes the conversation is something like this. Well, um, here's if, if you don't go to coaching and if you don't get a handle on these behaviors, we have to rethink 
our working relationship and you may not last you. And so the pain of losing a job is certainly greater than the pain of coaching. So that tension is often very necessary for these people to come to coaching. And if a person does not have someone that can um, offer that leverage, it may be very, very difficult for that person to come to coaching. Yeah, I just want to share, I recently had a client where I went in, I was hired by the CEO, started coaching the client, and then within um, a week, the CEO called me back and said, sorry, I had to fire that uh, your coachee. So I, I think you're really onto something there. Yes, yes. And so um, it really, now what I've found too, and I think this is related to what you're saying, but is also uh, I think very important. Uh, many of the clients that I do work with are highly, highly intelligent. Engineers, attorneys, physicians, sometimes research scientists. And so, so they have high cognitive intelligence, but their social and emotional intelligence is, is not on par with their um, IQ. And many of these people are highly analytical. And what happens is that they are perceived as being critical, judgmental, um, very driven. And uh, if they're lacking in empathy, they don't understand why people are having a hard time um, working with them. So it really is a, a good case to help them develop emotional intelligence. And yet, there does need to be some tension or some pressure uh, to bear into mind. And so um, um, the high, and, and this is one of the unwritten rules of organizational theory, which I don't think I put in the PowerPoint. Um, is that the higher up a person goes in an organization, the more dysfunctional they're allowed to be. So sadly, and if a person is very high in the organization, people are afraid of them. And if there isn't anyone to hold them accountable, uh, then it can be a dilemma. And the cost of that can be huge. Um, Robert Cooper wrote a book years ago called um, Executive EQ. And uh, what he found is that one person, uh, let's say if it's a CEO, um, one person in an organization of, um, of um, that level of influence out of touch with their empathy, their emotions, can actually create and impact um, a whole climate of fear in the organization. So that's the challenge, and yet the cost is of that um, unawareness is, is very great. So, so Peter, one other question came in. Someone was wanting to know the name of the expert you had referenced on uh, stress. Oh, OK. Um, Robert Sapolsky. And uh, if you Google, um, there is on Google now, um, and I have it in the um, reference list. I have him named um, in the references at the end of this um, handout. Um, my wife and I one day were wanting to watch a thriller, and we came across on Netflix The Portrait of a Killer. And we said, oh, this looks good. And it was stress. And it was all about uh, Robert Zapolsky's work on stress. It's a National Geographic um, movie. And um, it, it's now on YouTube. You can watch it for free. And it is one of the, um, I think, most fascinating and insightful um, uh, films that I've seen on the impact of stress on health, on um, social systems, as well as um, cognitive um, abilities. And so I'd highly recommend anybody, um, if you, if you um, would take the time, to just um, Google his name and um, stress the portrait of the killer, and you'll see his work is very well done. And that um, influenced me tremendously. So Peter, here's a really good question from uh, Sanjita. They ask, what process do you adopt while working with an angry executive? I mean, when they get angry with the coach. <laughs> OK. Well, what I found, and I'm going to try to go to the last slide. I think it's the last slide with the process. And for some reason, I think it's frozen now that my um, screen is up, but it is on the last uh, slide. Um, what I try to do, again, building trust is, is really important. And so here's something that is going to sound funny, but I think it's very true. When I see these executives and they come to me, now you have to look at the context. I'm a relationship person. I'm the Myers-Briggs. I am ENFP. I'm a softie. <laughs> um, you know, on the disc, I would be um, an I, uh, SI. And so um, yet, when they come to me, um, I've had many of them say, well, I feel like I'm coming to the school principal. And they're actually, believe it or not, very submissive, <laughs> which is strange for me. So so much of our influence is situational in the roles we have, which is, is very interesting. Now, from the start, 
I make it known that I'm on their side, of course, everything is confidential, and my goal and my mission is to help them be the kind of leader and have the impact that they want. So in other words, I'm on their side, I'm their coach, and I'm here to help them not only save their job, but to help them be, have the influence that they really, really want. So what I find is that uh, when we're talking, at first they're a little wary, and they're a little suspicious, and some of them are actually um, hurt that they've been told they have to go to coaching, but very quickly um, the goal is not only to have them trust me, but to actually have, have them see me as a resource, and that um, with coaching, I do believe it's important that they know there's nothing broken, there's nothing to be fixed, and uh, even with the best of intentions that maybe some things haven't worked out, and that I'm here to just help them develop um, greater self-awareness and to also understand the impact of their behaviors and have them actually understand the behaviors that will get them the followership that they, and the results that they want. So very, very rarely after the first session has, has, has there been anything less than um, engagement, that when they really do believe that I can help them and help them um, not only um, keep their job but also have um, very positive and impactful influence, um, after the first session especially, they become very engaged. And so the anger is very interesting. I, I never really see. So, Peter, here's one other question for you. Um, what would you say to direct reports who are at the mercy of an angry boss? <laughs> yeah. Well, what I would say, and this is where assertiveness is, is um, very important, boundaries are very important. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that, that uh, hopefully will address that question. Um, when I was in medical sales many, many, many years ago, um, I brought in a, a drill to an operating room, and the um, chairman of that department, it was a, uh, in this case, it was um, a neurosurgeon. Um, there was a, another piece of equipment that malfunctioned, and uh, he was known to be a loose cannon, and he started screaming, stopping his feet, and took out all his anger on the charge nurse, and uh, then the most amazing thing happened after he finished screaming at her, and it was screaming, um, she looked at him directly and uh, she said, just because you're a doctor doesn't give you the license to treat me with disrespect, I need an apology right now. Now this is one of the moments that time freezes, and I'm sure it was only a split second, but uh, it seemed like an eternity. Um, people stopped blinking, I felt like um, everyone in the room was in suspended uh, animation, how dare a nurse speak to the chairman of the <laughs> of neurosurgery in that way, but what happened, he blinked first and he said, you know what, you're right, and it wasn't your fault, I'm sorry, and then the case went on, and amazingly, after the case, I saw them in the break room, and they were chatting very comfortably, both were relaxed and both were chatting, and in this hospital I called on for almost 10 years, nine of the charge nurses had resigned because of him, and she is the one that stayed, and he trusted her, and he actually um, saw her as, in many ways, his right hand. He, and that, he, she garnered his respect, if that makes sense. So what I'm saying is, and this is um, validated in social psychology, that if we ever allow anyone to treat us disrespectfully, they'll despise us for it. Now, sometimes it is very difficult to call them in a meeting or board meeting or that, but I do think it's very important if someone is angry and pressing those boundaries in a very firm, assertive, and respectful way to say, look, if we're going to work here, this is going to work, I need respect. And uh, I think the boundaries are very important. And uh, a lot of times people are afraid. They're afraid if I stand up, I'll get fired, I'll get punished. But I think it is really important to set boundaries and to be able to say, look, if we're going to make this work, there has to be respect here. And, and and what I just saw was disrespectful, and I need you to be aware of that, or this is what I need. And I think that's where assertiveness um, comes in. And I do know it's easier said than done, but I do believe it to be very true. You know, Peter, I just want to um, say yes and to that. I've been in situations, exact same um, persona, uh, has a uh, kind of abusive personality, very much an alpha, and you know they look at me as the coach and say like, you know, what are you supposed to be? You know, what are you doing here? They question what I'm doing, and you kind of have to get in their face and mm -hmm. play that like mirror that alpha back to them because yeah. once they see that, it's like, oh, okay, this is someone who's at my equal 
they're you know yeah. they're willing to take me on. Um, right. But you do have to step out of your comfort zone. I mean, I'm a pretty mild mannered sort of person, but there are situations I think where the coach has to you have to mirror back what you know the the client is kind of putting out there. Um, yeah. Yes, I think so. And, and, and what's interesting, whenever I do team workshops, oftentimes when I work with an angry executive, I'll work with their team. I'll do a personality assessment to start so that they understand each other's profiles and how to better flex each other's styles. And um, what I, I say this jokingly, but I think it's also very true that you know, if you look at this um, quadrant, you know, in a um, team development session, you could say that what we're trying to do is toughen up the softies, the relationship folks. Uh, we need to soften up the toughies. These are the bulldozers. To help them with the soft skills. Uh, loosen the noose with the analytical types. Help them um, um, be a little bit more accepting and open to change, especially. And uh, and also to help the expressives um, understand things like time management and how to um, communicate most directly. And so. Uh, what I find um, working with the team is that if you have everybody um, train each other, the best way to manage me, motivate me, it shuts me down, um, having these conversations um, can be very useful to help everyone understand the impact of their behaviors. Um, those that are softies like myself, if we are not assertive, if we allow ourselves to be unassertive, and if we get resentful and, um, and negative, um, we can become passive aggressive, which is the power of the powerless. And that is actually like raving, waving a red, full and a red flag in front of a bull. So it's very important um, so that we don't go down that spiral of that last slide um, where we need to recognize the person more than likely has good intent. And what we need to do is create agreed behaviors or operating agreements, let's say, that are going to allow us to do the work. And I think everybody, I think it is fair to say that everybody wants the same thing be successful and have good relationships, but unfortunately, um, because we're unaware, um, we often trigger people, we shut them down, and then we blame them for being shut down. And it's unintentional or unconscious, I find, for the most part. Uh, so Peter, here's a question from uh, Lynn Tumlinson. Lynn, this type of coaching can be challenging because of the factors you refer to. How do you suggest right. we approach boards, the CEO, president, to help them see coaching as a means to achieve the change needed? Well, um, here's the way that I would say that. Um, the first five years when I was a coach, I tried to promote coaching. This is what we can do, high, high engagement, high performance, and, and these things, and, and that's very valid. Um, but what I've come to learn and believe is that people pay attention to their tension. And so, um, for instance, what I have on my website, rather than promote leadership development or, or peak performing teams or that, I try to raise their tension. And so simple questions like, if you have a team where there's passive aggressive behavior, low morale, turnover, absenteeism, um, uh, lack of engagement, um, click here or contact me for a free consult. And so initially, when I do talk to an executive, um, again, I wanted to view the world from their point and what, what they're probably wanting coaching for is, well, why is my team so disengaged? Why are they not motivated? And so I'll just ask them a series of questions and, uh, and say, well, this is what we're going to work on and we're going to work on helping you create the kind of engagement and followership that, that's going to help you get the results that you want. So um, I think that there has to be some tension um, and a simple coaching question like, well, if you don't address these things, what is likely to happen? And if they come to the conclusion, well, if I don't address this, um, that's intolerable. And then I'll simply say, well, this is what coaching is going to focus on. We're going to work on getting a level of engagement and um, um, followership that's going to help get the results. Now, what I find, and this is on the last slide, I'm going to see if I can click it now. For some reason, uh, maybe because my screen is up, let me see if... Uh, I minimize this other screen if this will happen. But um, there is a process that I use, so it's not going, but I'll share with it. Uh, I'll share this with you, is that um, it, I find it very useful to do personality work, whatever, whether it's the Myers-Briggs or, or the People Map or DISC or whatever. I find it very in, useful to have a personality profile. Um, I find 360-degree feedback um, 
can be very useful, especially if it has a narrative component where people can specifically describe the behaviors. And, uh, and also I use that uh, model, the leadership action plan that we used, so that um, I think it's very important if an executive is willing to go through coaching that one, you don't in any way pathologize or say there's anything broken, but to say let's just take a look at your personality profile. Let's look at how this impacts others. Let's look at the 360 degree component. And I like to say that many of the large companies, when I worked years ago for the Center for Creative Leadership, that most of the very large companies, the Fortune 500, um, to get into the C-level, to get into these high levels of authority, um, they would have had to have gone through coaching, 360 feedback, some sort of leadership development program, that this was a rite of passage. So for those folks who were really um, resistant to coaching, I try to, in one way, raise the tension where, well, if you don't, um, address these, what can happen, but then also to minimize attention once they are on board is to say, look, you know, 360 feedback is really a rite of passage that uh, many companies will not allow a person to get to the sea level unless they've done their work, unless they become aware and mindful and uh, work on some of the things that we need to work on. And, you know, humor helps. Uh, I often like to say that we're all a sandwich short of a full picnic, myself included, and if anyone were to ask me if I'm aware, I'm a work in progress. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I'm self-aware, I'm working on it, but I'm a work in progress. And I think this is uh, the work that we all need to do. I believe that. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, Peter, here's a question from uh, Marion. Marion asks, I've worked for a narcissist, and since this is a pathological condition, we cannot influence a change in their behavior. Thoughts? Right. Yeah, uh, coaching doesn't work well with narcissists, borderline personality, sociopaths. Um, there's a brilliant book called um, The Sociopath Next Door by Martha Stout. And uh, in her estimates, after working 30 years with the uh, personality disorders, um, she found that 4% of the population are sociopaths. And that's one out of 25. So we all, we've all met them. And uh, unfortunately, narcissists, um, as well as the borderline and sociopaths, they're not very good coaching clients. Um, and so I think that many of us may be coaching people who work for them. I think the number one word is if you are working with a narcissist in relation to or have one in your family dynamic somewhere, um, the important thing is boundaries, 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 boundaries. And, um, you know, I've, I've met some clinical psychologists that have made some headway with narcissists, uh, but that's not the ideal candidate. And if I do think that I'm getting, if I have a narcissist, I would uh, um, rather not work with them. But um, Sometimes if, uh, I will, but yeah, um, I think that is very, very difficult. But sometimes um, if a person is really motivated, they can at least grow in some, some important aspects. And I think there is some research that shows that folks, after they get into the 50s, um, they can often mature from, um, from things like this in some form or measure. But um, generally, that's not the ideal coaching client. So, uh, and I just want to let everyone tech difficulties. That's why Carl has sort of went away and I've stepped in. Um, uh -huh. Here's one question that's come up, which is, um, what about shame? This is a question from uh, Regineldor, and they say, what about shame? The staff might experience shame when the boss is angry with them. Shame yeah. kills innovation and creativity, according to Brene Brown. Have you addressed that with your clients? Yes, yes. And, and, and there's some um, really old... Uh, Work. Timothy Leary started this in the um, circumflex model, and there's quite a bit of work done since that um, when a boss is perceived as dominant and hostile, critical, judgmental, and angry, he triggers submissive hostile behavior, and shame would be considered in that quadrant of submissive hostile, shame, resentful, fear, and, and that type of thing. And so when someone is, is shamed, they're going to be um, in the, um, their sympathetic nervous system is activated, and they'll be in the flight. And, uh, and a lot of their behavior will be self-protecting or defensive. And so um, if they're feeling shame, then what they want to do is protect themselves against feeling further shame. Uh, um, it, it doesn't make things work. So um, in working with a person that is feeling, let's say, um, shame, um, they, again, they need to learn to be self-accepting and be able to move and to be more assertive and, let's say, a little bit more dominant. Um, I'll say one thing before I forget it, you know, in my years of coaching, um, what I found what keeps people stuck 
many people stuck is they have self-criticism, resentment, and fear. Self-criticism, resentment, or anger and fear is what often keeps people stuck and does certainly impact their brain ability, their brain's ability to problem solve and move forward. So that's that's a very um, important emotion, I think, to to be aware of and to manage and to um, and to move and to let go of, let's say. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, for uh, coming in between. The problem is uh, that the screen where all the questions appear, I uh -huh. should have summarized for Peter, seem to have disappeared. I'm sorry yeah. for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for helping me out. The good news is that I found back the screen with questions. <laughs> um, Peter, um, uh, do, uh, how do you want to proceed for the last five minutes? Continuing with questions, or do you want to still co come to a conclusion? What is your option? Well, what, I think the questions will be good. I think that um, if you, there is a very logical um, approach to dealing with these angry or, or unaware executives, and that's really to generate self-awareness. And um, in that last slide that everybody will have is really there is it's, it's not rocket science. But um, if you can get someone who is willing to um, um, have you work with their personality, um, go through a 360 assessment, and um, and really um, be open to understanding how their behaviors are impacting others, I think you can make a lot of headway. So it isn't rocket science. Um, and I found that if a person does perceive you as really being on their side, um, that they'll be open to doing the work for the most part. And uh, not every, it's kind of, I look at working with um, groups or individuals like popcorn, and uh, some kernels aren't going to pop, but if you give this um, um, a systematic approach, uh, you can get many people make some um, tremendous changes, and I've seen some um, almost uh, seemingly miraculous turnarounds. So, so things can happen very positively, just not all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, uh, dear friends, are there any further questions that you would like to, to ask? I see one more question on uh, the DISC as a, as a tool, the DISC personality test that I've not seen passing through the discussions. Uh, anything you want to, to share on that, Peter? On the DISC? Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, if you look at um, um, what would be the DISC, um, I use, I've done DISC training and I've also done um, training with other assessments as well. And uh, I think that there's one humanity, and there are many assessments that cover um, similar, and sometimes some cover things that don't. Um, the way I look at it is that every personality assessment you know, really does have its uh, merits. Um, what I find um, in working with the DISC or other four quadrant personality assessments, um, the simpler the better. And if we can recognize, let's say, on somebody's a high D on the DISC, they're driver, bulldozer, and very driven. If they can understand that it's not my weaknesses that get me in trouble, it's the overuse of my strengths, and then you have a conversation where you can look at, well, how do we turn back these strengths so that they're being used productively rather than pushing away the very things that you want. So uh, I guess I would leave uh, with personality that um, I, I think uh, there are many great assessments out there. Um, I found one or two or three or two that I find to be very practical and uh, useful, and I think the key is to see them all as a tool, but just like a tool, a hammer can be used to build a wall, but it can also hit somebody on the head. And uh, yes. the main thing is if it can help somebody be self-accepting and accepting of others and more aware of how they impact others, then I think that's very productive and useful. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, Peter. Um, I think that in terms of questions, we've had the, the, the essence uh, summarized. Uh, so I give the last minute to you, Peter, and then I will share the last, uh, the last password. Okay, great. Well, uh, again, um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, my hope is that um, this has given everybody some useful um, insights or some useful um, um, tips or even um, wherewithal to work with them, I think um, there's a huge need out there for leaders to be more aware. And uh, in the coaching community, I think it's a real calling uh, to really have that kind of impact. And when you help a leader become more aware, you've not only helped him, but you've helped their team, their organization, as well as their family. So there's a huge ripple effect. So, so um, you know, I applaud er everyone who is doing the work. Okay, Peter. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, great, great session that was, uh, I think, a good mix of, of from 